Um, so it's my, my pleasure to introduce Neil Carter as uh, the first uh, seminar speaker in our uh, joint FWCB HDNR series this spring. Uh, and we want to thank Catherine Stoner and Mike Manfredo, uh, who are our sponsors for, uh, for this spring, uh, and also John Hayes, Dean Warner College, uh, for his support in uh, getting us together uh, for this and uh, this, the, the next few events. Um, we organized the, the seminar series around the theme of human-wildlife interactions, uh, with the, the goal being to foster collaboration among the, the departments and CSU more broadly, uh, and also uh, with the uh, guest speakers as well. And Neil's work exemplifies the type of science that we want to promote uh, <clears throat> and direct toward human wildlife challenges. Uh, Neil's an assistant professor at the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. Uh, he did his master's in fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State, and his, oh sorry, PhD in fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State, and then master's of science uh, at Michigan uh, in terrestrial ecology. And Neil's work examines spatial dynamics that characterize interactions between wildlife and people in the context of global change. And the work uses field monitoring and social surveys, uh, remote sensing, GIS, and simulation methods, um, primarily in the American West, and Nepal, Mozambique, and a few other sites. And he's published in PNAS, Trends in Ecology and Evolution, Conservation Biology, Ecology and Society, uh, among other journals. And today he'll be talking on spatial dynamics of human dimensions of wildlife and their feedbacks on conservation. Uh, so you join me in welcoming Neil uh, to CSU. Thanks, John. Well, thank you everybody for being here. It is uh, honestly a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the sponsors for hosting me. It's been uh, wonderful so far to meet a lot of you and talk about all these cool projects and, and cool research that's going on. And um, <clears throat> when I was invited, I thought about, I was trying to think about what kind of work I could talk about that would be interesting to this really interdisciplinary group. And so um, what I decided to talk about some was some ongoing work. It's pretty new, so putting that out there. And my hope is that it will initiate some conversations about ways to um, look at human wildlife interactions and coexistence, um, borrow methods and techniques from different disciplines, but I'm also really open and, and keen on hearing your input and ideas on you know, how to progress some of this work and take it to the next step because it is pretty early on, but I wanted to share it all with you if that's all right. All right, so before I get going, definitely have to acknowledge a pretty tremendous group of people that have helped on the work that I'm going to talk about here. The first is um, Abby Sage. She was a graduate student of mine at Boise State, and she now is at the USGS National Wildlife Health Center. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Nicholas Maglioka at the University of Alabama and Dr. Andres Baiza Castro at Arizona State University um, helped me develop the agent-based model that I'll talk a little bit about today. Okay, so lots of interest from people in this room and scholars all over the world in this idea of shared landscapes and coexistence. I mean, how are we going to live together with wildlife and people in this changing um, uh, context around the world? Um, you know, here's an image I just found I thought was so neat of buffalo just outside Denver. Um, but we also have examples in all over the world, classic one of leopards living at high densities in Mumbai and in India. You know, one of the most populous cities on earth has a large carnivore living right there with these people. And also just recently, as I started to think about the ubiquity of shared landscapes, you know, how, where in the world are people and wildlife having to figure out how to coexist? I came across this recent um, post on the conversation of a map that's being created by Dr. Earl Ellis and Dr. James Watson and some other scholars to try to characterize shared landscapes around the world. And the, the, the takeaway for me from this map is that, okay, if it's 55 to 56 percent of the Earth's terrestrial surface that they're characterizing as a shared landscape, this is a really big problem. Like, this is a big issue, challenge um, that deserves a lot of attention and work for sure. The other thing that came across to me is how spatial this is, like this idea of the spatial lens to start looking at questions of sharing landscapes and coexistence. And what ultimately came to me was um, my background is in wildlife and spatial ecology, 
And I wasn't seeing a lot of spatial sciences being applied to human dimensions work, social psychology. And so what I wanted to try to do here and introduce you to is trying to bring over some of the spatial sciences and analyses to human dimensions work and integrate that with um, you know, classic uh, spatial ecology of wildlife that we care about. And to give a couple illustrative examples of ways I think that understanding the spatial properties of human tolerance is going to be important for thinking about space for wildlife. Um, you know, interactions with elephants, and there's a lot of top elephant scholars here, and there's a lot of work about the risks and costs of living with elephants. And people can adapt to those in many different ways, and some of them can be really extreme to push those elephants out of areas, to kill elephants that might be causing too much risk to those areas. Undoubtedly, that impacts the space use of those animals, their ability to disperse, find mates, populations connect. So similarly, with risky and dangerous animals like grizzlies, people can respond to those in many different ways, many of which include lethal responses, and those are oftentimes um, good responses. But you can also think about how that will impact the way those animals are using space, the, the landscape of risk, the landscape of coexistence, whatever you might call it, um, and ultimately that has some interesting spatial implications. In contrast, you can think of other ways that people are willing to adapt with these species, and there might be some spatial implications for the wildlife that we're interested in. If people are willing to use, for example, uh, noise deterrents to non-lethally uh, deter elephants from crop uh, fields, or beehives to you know, keep animals, elephants, off those crops, that'll have implications on those animals and their movements. Similarly with grizzlies, using livestock guarding dogs or burying and composting livestock carcasses. These are alternatives that will likely change the space use of animals and the ability for people on wildlife to, to coexist. So with that in mind, for the outline for today, I want to talk about two categories of work that relate uh, somewhat. The first is um, work that we're doing uh, of a rancher survey of acceptance toward grizzlies in an area called the High Divide between Idaho and Montana, a big vast area. And the second part is work that my colleagues and I are doing to look at social networks and how those uh, mediate the sharing of risk perception about wildlife and the potential feedbacks of that on wildlife communities. And we're going to use a stylized agent-based model um, to explore some of those relationships. So ranchers and grizzlies in the Intermountain West. I mean, this is a long history of conflict. The story of how grizzlies were largely exterminated from the West is all too common. Uh, but basically, people moved into the area, quickly became evident that the high altitude, semi-arid land wasn't really good for growing crops, so they started uh, growing livestock. Native ungulates were the first to be removed because they directly competed with livestock, followed after by native carnivores. And number one target of these eradication campaigns was the grizzly bear. Some of these campaigns were even sponsored by the government. Um, and so it didn't take very long for the numbers and the range of grizzlies to shrink rapidly to only a handful of subpopulations that we see there in the, in the orange um, in the Intermountain West, one of which includes the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And grizzlies were listed on the endangered species list in the last four decades. Their numbers have been you know, recovering, growing, expanding, and they're leaving national parks and entering these human-modified anthropogenic landscapes. And it sparked a uh, contentious conversation about, among different stakeholders about how to manage bears in the future. The conservation community has been really interested in how do we connect these populations? You know, how do we um, enhance connectivity? Where are these bears going to go as they expand outside of Yellowstone's, uh, Yellowstone National Park and the Northern Continental uh, Divide ecosystem? Uh, a really cool piece a couple years ago by Peck et al. used GPS collared bears and Circuitscape to try to map where these corridors and routes would likely be. And so you can see there's this interesting kind of like spider web network of where bears will try to move between Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide. Dark purple areas where they model that they'll be more likely to go and the yellow and orange are where they think they're potentially less likely to move. But what I want to reiterate is that once you leave the parks, this landscape gets really complicated for bears. The blue here is privately owned parcels. So a huge chunk of this landscape is privately owned grazing lands. Um, there's towns, there's roads, there's a network of roads 
bears will have to navigate that pretty complex landscape. Not surprisingly, there's a lot of um, diverse opinions among the ranching community about having bears recover and expand into these areas. Some of them are frustrated. They feel uh, resentful about it. Maybe they're very negative about having bears onto their area and, and impacting their livelihoods. But on the other side, there is evidence of ranchers that are willing to adapt and coexist with predators like wolves and, and grizzlies. And so when you look at this, what I started to think about was, um, what are the impacts potentially on, on bears? And what's, what's some ways that we can navigate through this? And what I wanted to show here is that the navigating through this complex landscape actually has it, uh, outcomes for bears in terms of human-induced mortality. 2018 saw a huge spike in human-induced mortality of, of bears, almost twice that of the, of the mean for the last 15 years. And I believe the 2019 data is comparable to 2018. Certainly some of that could be because there's more bears and they're, they're going out and, and encountering people. But I certainly think some of this has to do with uh, how ranchers are perceiving the expanding grizzly population. So when it comes down to it, I think that we have negative impacts potentially on ranchers and we definitely have negative impacts on grizzlies if you have high levels of conflict. But what's missing, I think, is we know very little about the spatial distributions and patterns of human attitudes. Uh, toward grizzly bears as they move through this landscape. Where do people feel less or more accepting to having bears? And that might be useful to starting to think about where to target interventions and management. <coughs> so with that in mind, my uh, colleagues and a research team at University of Idaho and Boise State University, we developed a social survey that we sent out to ranchers, 2,400 ranchers in about 16 counties in Montana and Idaho. Um, 750 of them came back of those, 505 completed all of the questions that pertain to grizzlies. So we had about a 21% response rate, which is fairly good for uh, this community and um, a mail-in survey. Using that data, we calculate social acceptance of grizzly, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then we calculated two models, an aspatial model, where we included predictor variables that were within the survey itself. But then we were also interested in trying to model the spatial distribution of acceptance. So we tried to compile publicly available spatial predictors of social acceptance. And I'll focus on that today in this talk. Then we spatially predicted acceptance into the study area. And finally, we overlay it on this map of ecological corridors for grizzly bears based on their movements from the GPS collars. And in terms of modeling acceptance, we focused on three explanatory categories. And we focused on these in part because a lot of the literature supports that these are the kind of uh, predictors that are likely to influence social acceptance for grizzlies. But also we were interested in trying to find spatial data that would be proxies for some of these categories. And it turns out that's really hard to do because <laughs> spatial data doesn't always map back to some of these concepts. And so I am interested on some of your insights on maybe some ways that we could get additional spatial data. Right, so have some fun little graphics to represent each of those. Okay, so dependent variable was this social acceptance. We took five survey items that I show here and we calculated a factor analysis from those to create a single metric. Um, negative values were low acceptance, positive values were higher acceptance. So here we're looking at the distribution of those acceptance scores across this landscape. We've aggregated the responses to a seven kilometer uh, resolution grid cell in large part to protect the privacy of the ranchers. Um, it also helps to sort of view the data a little bit. So this is just the raw data, acceptance scores based on that factor analysis. And as you can see, it's, a it's actually pretty heterogeneous across space. Lots of areas that have relatively low acceptance, um, lots of areas that you know, have medium to high acceptance toward grizzlies. So the first thing we did is we just used a fairly simple hotspot analysis. It's a local Geddes Ord statistic, and it essentially creates concentric rings around a focal spot, and it calculates how many instances of a value that's positive or negative that's greater than would be expected if it were random. And when it finds that distance, that looks like it's above, it's not random, then it says that's a spatial cluster that's statistically significant. When we ran that analysis, we start to see some interesting clusters emerge. One is a, a cluster of relatively low acceptance to bears in Salmon, Idaho. And this is actually fairly outside of the main habitat for grizzlies. 
And there's also some fairly large, statistically significant spatial clusters of high acceptance around Bozeman, Helena, and also some areas just outside uh, of the national park. But again, we're interested, I mean, I think this in and of itself is, is pretty interesting information just to get a, a sense of the trend and the spatial distribution of acceptance. But can we predict acceptance? So for that, we've got our um, predictor categories here on the left, and we had a number of different hypotheses, and we compiled data for the aspatial model and the spatial model. And I just want to quickly go through some of the spatial predictors with you because it has implications for trying to interpret the results. So experience clearly might have an uh, impact on acceptance, and we could ask those questions directly in the survey. But for the spatial predictors, we used distance to bear range, and our expectation was ranchers that lived closer to bear range experience more potential conflicts with them or perceive more risk and are more likely to have a lower acceptance. Elevation is kind of a control variable, but in general, ranches are at lower elevations and wildlife corridors are at slightly higher elevations. For economic dependency on ranching, in the, in the survey, we could ask questions about how much of their income comes from ranching. But for our spatial predictors, we use census data on income. Our assumption is that most of the income of these ranchers is coming from ranching. We don't know exactly how much of that is true, but we did try to select individuals who indicated that most of their livelihood is from ranching. So this might be largely true. We also calculated their distance to public lands, the idea being that if they're uh, raising livestock and grazing those livestock near or in nearby public lands, that that'll be related to their dependency on ranching, and potentially um, a, more, a negative attitude towards grizzlies if they're closer to public lands. Finally, their support for conservation in general. If they support the idea of conservation, then maybe they also support grizzly conservation. Here again, in the survey, we could ask all sorts of you know, targeted questions. But spatially, we had to get a little bit creative. <laughs> um, and some of these, I think, worked out. And some of these, I think, are warrant a lot more uh, future work. The first we used is the Wildland Urban Index, which is this metric of the intermixture between wildlands and um, um, development. So a higher value means there's more intermixture, and a lower value means there's, you know, it's all wildlands. And what this ends up um, representing is that lower values tend to be low to medium human densities, population densities. And our thought was this might be represented by groups who tend to have a more utilitarian viewpoint towards wildlife. Whereas the higher values of, of WUI or the Wildland Urban Index, higher population densities might reflect groups of people that have a more mutualistic relationship with wildlife like grizzlies. Elk harvest is another one where elk harvest is determined by uh, elk populations for game management units. The idea being that people that are in areas with high levels of elk and are also participating in hunting of elk may also be supportive of grizzly conservation in general. <coughs> Certainly, I think you can make an argument for an alternative hypothesis there. And then lastly, we had spatial data on conservation easements. This is the idea that you can put your land in an easement that will keep it from being developed in the foreseeable future. And if in a surrounding area around each of these respondents, there's a lot of conservation easements, we expect that that community might largely be supportive of conservation. So we really tried to come up with as many spatial predictors as we could find. Okay, so we, frankly, the model doesn't really explain all that much variance if you compare it to the aspatial model, where you had all those uh, variables that we could extract from the survey. But we did have a handful of significant relationships that I think um, are interesting and warrant a little bit of additional um, interpretation. The first is distance to bear range. This was contrary to our hypothesis. It was a negative relationship. Ranchers that were closer to bear range were more accepting of bears. Plausible um, explanation could be that people that live there no longer fear bears. They know that the interactions are quite rare. Uh, they've experienced it. They've become you know, inured to living with bears, and they're OK with it. They're fine with it. Um, but an additional thing that might be confounding this is that we have no data on ecotourism. A lot of the distance to bear range is essentially a proxy for distance to Yellowstone. And so some of the ecotourism activities could be conflating our, our interpretation of this distance to bear range. So a lot more that we could do there, I think, to interpret that. Wildland-urban interface, higher levels of that index, 
greater acceptance of bears. Again, one plausible explanation is that this is a group of people that move there, amenity-driven migration. They were, were coming there with positive viewpoints, mutualistic viewpoints toward wildlife like grizzlies. But again, I think we can do some more digging into there about land tenure. How long have these people been living there? I think that could help us to interpret this a little bit more. And then finally, and I, I, was, I felt um, very positive about this result, the number of conservation easements did directly and positively relate to acceptance to grizzlies. And this, I think, is really important. Conservation easements is a very powerful tool for land management in these areas. And if people are supportive of conservation in those areas, then this is, um, I think, really indicative to long-term uh, persistence of these animals on these landscapes. Okay, so then we spatially predict this based on those significant relationships. And with any spatial model, caveats abound. I mean, there's all sorts of artifacts that we should be wary of, um, but I just want to draw your attention to the general trend here. I mean, the, the western part of this landscape, mostly in Idaho, largely has less accepting ranchers toward grizzlies in those areas. And again, this is an area that is not yet seeing a lot of bear um, activity and presence. And there's a push to try to get the Bitterroot ecosystem to have bears in there where they, they currently are not, but it has sufficient habitat for those bears. So this could be problematic if there is widespread low acceptance to grizzlies in those areas. <coughs> also interesting to point out, this laser pointer is not working, there we go. Um, fairly high acceptance right outside Yellowstone. And I think that's positive to see that that's gonna be clearly an area of that first exposure to anthropogenic landscapes coming out of the national park, um, at least compared to the other part of the landscape, is relatively high acceptance. But these areas in the middle are a little bit um, interesting. And if we overlay it with those corridors from that map that I showed you earlier, you can start to kind of visualize some places that might be um, problematic or at least a place to start targeting conflict prevention techniques. Um, this area here right in the middle you know, this is equidistant between Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide, and it's, and it's a highway for bears to try to go through there. And there's a big patch of low acceptance, and that to me is concerning. This area over here too, this western pathway to get to the bitter roots or to get up to the Northern Continental Divide, large swath of potentially low acceptance. Um, but, you know, areas through here, you know, might be relatively smooth going for bears. Okay, so attitudes are all well and good, but if any of you have done human dimensions work, attitudes are not the same thing as behaviors. And we kind of want to know what the behaviors are on the ground. So through the survey, we also asked some questions about their behaviors toward predators, um, inclusive, you know, including grizzlies. And I just want to quickly go through those because those also have some very, um, really fascinating spatial patterns. So we asked ranchers if they uh, use lethal predator control, and we didn't provide definition. We just said lethal predator control. So that could be predator control towards coyotes, wolves, what have you. But it had to be uh, voluntary use of this behavior on their privately owned lands. Do they compost or bury carcasses? Do they use a variety of non-lethal predator control techniques like flattery or noise deterrence? And do they use wildlife friendly fencing? We asked them if they currently use it, if they've tried it but no longer use it, and if they plan to use it in the future, or if they've never used it and don't plan to use. And for the purposes of the subsequent analysis, we actually break this up into just use and non-use. I want to focus on the use a little bit. In terms of the number of the participants that use that, over 60% use lethal removal on their privately owned lands. 55% use carcass removal. 50% use wildlife-friendly fencing, but only 15% use non-lethal techniques. So again, we used that spatial clustering algorithm to see if there were these st statistically significant clusters. And for lethal control, we see a big area of use right in the middle there, just north of Bozeman and Butte, right through this really apparently important corridor for, for grizzlies. But there's also a big chunk of non-use down here to the west of Yellowstone. But again, not very much grizzly activity there to my understanding. Carcass removal. Um, what's interesting here is that there's a, a spatial cluster of non-use around Helena. Unclear why that is, and I'm, I'm you know, interested if there's some ideas there of why folks wouldn't be using carcass removal um, in that particular area. <coughs> Wildlife friendly fencing, not large clusters, but there are a handful of clusters around Bozeman, just north of Yellowstone. <coughs> 
And finally, non-lethal techniques, there is a fairly large cluster in the same area where people were also using lethal techniques. So some interesting questions there about are people using a variety of techniques to try to live with these animals or are these different groups of people that are using distinctly different techniques? But regardless, I think this is going to be a really hard place for bears to try to get through. They're really far away from Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide. Um, there's a lot of roads, there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of activity there. So I think, you know, the takeaway from this for me is starting to look at what happens if you implement con uh, conflict reduction techniques in these places and see if those um, clusters of behaviors and acceptances change over time and through space. But something else that kind of emerges for me when I look at this and I think about clusters. So far I've been treating people as if they're vacuums, like they don't communicate with each other. But people are really social. Like we are the epitome of a social animal. And one of the things that we're probably going to talk about is risks from wildlife. This is really salient information. So segueing into this next part, I was thinking about, well, we have these clusters. Is this because of the geography? And or is it because people talk to each other and they start to adopt similar practices to each other because that's what we do as a community? So to look at this, um, I, started, I got interested in this idea of social networks and the social transmission of risk and start to see if we can look at feedbacks on wildlife. Because I think that if we start thinking about these coordinated behaviors <coughs> or non-coordinated behaviors, this could be really impactful for thinking about corridor placement, corridor maintenance for really important species that we're all interested in, in working on, like elephants. To do that, my colleagues and I developed an agent-based model. And this is a dynamic system that has multiple interacting agents. Agents can be anything. In this case, there are wildlife individuals and human individuals. But the key thing is that the agents have to be complex individuals with autonomy. They can learn, they can adapt, they can see, they can plan, they can have vision. Um, and in general, the philosophy of an agent-based modeling approach is that you're growing a model from these individual interactions with each other and with the landscape in contrast to a top-down modeling approach where you have a set of equations and you're trying to solve those equations. So it's just a different way at, at doing models. In our particular model, which we called Wildlife Human Interactions in Shared Landscapes, or WHISTLE, <laughs> and I giggle because I spent way too much time trying to figure out something that made sense as an acronym. Um, the best I could come up with is WHISTLE. Um, but in general, what we have is we have two agent types. We have a farmer and we have a wildlife agent. And importantly, this is a stylized environment. So this is not a particular place or a particular animal. This is really just a general model to explore these kinds of questions and interactions. And then these two agents interact on the landscape. And that landscape has habitat quality values and it has crop production values. The farmer obviously grows crops in those, on those particular areas and gets revenue from those crops. And wildlife can sometimes uh, eat crops and damage those crops uh, if, they, if they go onto those. Farmers can respond. They can build fences. This is their response to the damage or the risk from wildlife. So my question is, what happens if farmers start talking to each other about this risk? And then in turn, what happens to those, to those animals? To do that, the agent has to make a decision every time step. What am I going to do with my labor? They can use it for crop production, they can use it for our farm activities, or they can build fences. In other words, it's a cost to build a fence. If you're building a fence, you're not using your time to, to produce crops. Influencing that is a risk perception algorithm. And it's a function of two things in this particular case. Habitat quality. So if the farmer perceives their farm to be on an area with high habitat quality, they're already starting with a relatively high individual risk perception of negative encounters from wildlife but also past events. So if a farmer just had a conflict with wildlife, it's really salient and that risk perception is really high and it decays over time if they haven't had any conflicts. If they have enough conflicts or enough damages, again, they build the fence. Now what we're trying to do is we're trying to have this risk perception start to influence the risk perception of their neighbor. And what we hypothesize could happen is if enough of that information was transmitted this farmer would start to build fences preemptively because they're not experiencing conflict, but they're getting this huge flow of information about risk and they're like, yeah, okay, I'll build fences because it sounds like we have a problem. The other thing that can happen is that if you build enough fences, we think that you could actually displace wildlife. 
from high habitat quality areas because they've basically built fences to keep them out and start pushing wildlife, spilling that conflict onto other nearby farms who had otherwise not experienced that kind of conflict. We had two different human wildlife geographies, spatial scenarios in our um, model. On the left, we had a mixed landscape. So wildlife and farmers that were all intermixed on the landscape and can inter interact with each other, kind of like an open savanna. On the right, we had what we called a protected area uh, configuration, where you have a hard boundary, human settlements and farms on one side, and wildlife on the other, with a very thin interface where they can interact. Now, I've tried to put some videos in here, and I know if anyone's ever tried to put videos in a presentation, it works 99% of the time at home, and almost a guarantee it won't work here right now. But I'm going to try to show the model implementation for these two different geographies. Let's see if it works. Okay, on the left, the mixed landscape, just real quickly, the farms, you can see the locations of the farms, and this is based on the crop production value. So the farms try to find the ve very best possible areas to, to produce crops. They set down their farm, and then we establish a network, and all the lines are showing you who is part of their social network that they can share information with. These little black dots are actually, they're little wolves. Um, those are all wildlife agents. And let's see. Okay, cool. The yellow pixels are where they're actually farming. They're actually producing crops. The blue pixels are where they're building fences. The darker the blue, the newer the fence. And they can maintain that fence or they can just let it go. And so the lighter blue means they're starting to let that fence go and not be maintained. It becomes less effective. Uh, and then here we're looking at the same thing, but we're looking at that protected area landscape. And you can see the way they build fences is sort of like, you know, they're kind of putting it out there as a perimeter because that's where they're having a lot of the conflicts occurs on this one side. Okay, so um, spatial configurations, this is an important part of the scenario testing. But the other thing we wanted to look at was how much risk are they sharing with each other? And we had two scenarios, one that we called low social influence. And all this means is that we weighted the individual risk perception to be much greater than what they could get from their neighbors. So I'm going to weight my own individual risk perception, and I don't, I don't really care what you guys are, are telling me because we've weighted it that way. The alternative is a high social influence, where basically it's like a fire hose of risk transmission from everyone that's part of their social network. And so that's going to outweigh their own individual risk perception. And so these are the two um, scenarios that um, subsequent analysis will, will be based on. Okay, the first thing I want to show in the results um, in the two different landscapes, mixed landscape on the left and the protected area gradient, is the synchronicity in behaviors. So here is the simple correlogram of fencing behaviors for our farmers. X-axis is the distance in the number of pixels from every single farm. And the Y-axis is the degree of correlation in time and space that they're building fences. The purple are, are scenarios where we had that high social influence and the dark gray is low social influence. And what I want to um, show you simply is that when we had social influence, the farmers are synchronizing their behaviors. You, you basically, where the information is cascading through the network really quickly and they're all building fences in essentially the same time step as a response to this flow of risk perception. And it's a little bit more pronounced in that mixed landscape. And we'll see a little bit more of this. So what does that mean? If we have on the x-axis, we can vary how much damage from wildlife per event. So let's imagine on the left side of this x-axis, this is a deer kind of nibbling on your garden, you know, eh, whatever. Um, and then we move over over here, and this is, you know, a lion eating your livestock, elephant devastating your, your crops. Um, how do the people respond to that? With the high social influence, when that damage gets, you know, above about 0.25, they start building fences across the board, and that immediately starts removing available habitat for wildlife because we're building and maintaining these fences because there's this strong transmission of risk. In turn, the encounters per farmer also decreases because we've built essentially this like fortress of fences to keep wildlife out of there. We don't see quite the same strength of response in the protected area landscape because of that thin interface. There's not as many interactions not until you start getting um, per capita damage that's really high. Then you start seeing people consistently maintaining fences and essentially removing that part of the habitat or landscape uh, as habitat for wildlife. But I think what's really interesting is trying to figure out uh, um, these spillover effects. And what we discovered is it has to do with how many connections are in your social network. 
So here on the x-axis, we have the number of social connections that we simulated in the network. The y-axis is the number of fences that are built per year in our simulation. High social influence, not surprisingly, the more connections you have, the more the risk information is, is cascading through the landscape and we're all building fences together. But what happens is, if you look at this zone, people that were basically not getting the memo, they were totally disconnected from the network, very few connections, in some case zero connections. With that high social influence, they're starting to get the spillover of conflicts onto their farms that they otherwise wouldn't have had when we compared it to the low social influence, that dark gray um, part of, this, of the scenario. So the disconnected farmers start getting the spillover of all these animals that are being essentially displaced from areas that are, are fenced. So that was really interesting. And then to, to further kind of interrogate that, to see if the spillover is, is really what we think is happening, we also looked at the initial habitat quality. And there's a lot happening here. So I'm going to kind of draw your attention to this part of the graph. Purple, again, is the high social influence. Lots of transmission of risk. This is the mixed landscape. People who had less connections, excuse me, and low habitat suitability to begin with, so basically places where wildlife would not have been wanting to go to, are getting a lot of conflict all of a sudden in the high social influence because wildlife are being pushed off of the high habitat quality areas into marginal habitats, and the people that were disconnected and not building fences start experiencing more risks. Okay, so um, to wrap up there, socially transmitted risk seems to be creating an interesting feedback between wildlife and ranchers. And the spatial configuration, this mixed landscape or the protected area landscape, also is influencing these dynamics and feedbacks. And what's kind of cool is we started going back to the literature, the empirical literature, and trying to see if we were seeing the spillover effect. Um, originally, I wasn't looking for that, but we started looking at, at cases, and we started seeing it all over the place. And usually it was mentioned in the discussion. It wasn't a focal part of the analysis, but people were saying, hey, when we did this intervention here, oops, people who weren't doing the intervention started seeing more of these animals. So one study in Kenya with, with elephants that used a connectivity model said, if people built fences in this one area, chances are you're going to push those elephants to areas that don't use those fences and cause conflicts. A little bit more of a model. But also in Kenya, researchers looking at deterrence of lions found that BOMAs that were using LED lights were effective, but they were also pushing lions onto nearby BOMAs that weren't using LED lights as a deterrent of lions. And then finally, there's been a number of studies on wolves that have shown that people use flattery as a deterrent for wolves might be actually pushing those wolves onto nearby ranches who may not be using those particular techniques. And now those ranches are experiencing more conflict with these animals. So I think it's really interesting to start connecting this empirical work with this relatively stylized model. So to conclude, um, I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot of work that can and should be done to spatialize the human dimensions and start using spatial sciences and bringing them together with some of the ecological sciences to understand connectivity and barriers to movement. And the spatial environment definitely influences attitudes and behaviors and I think it's still relatively unexplored. I think there's a deep vein of work that you know, all of us here and others can start to do on this particular area. And finally, there's so much talk about social ecological systems. A lot of it is largely conceptual. And I am totally to blame for contributing to that conceptual stuff on social ecological systems. But I think using the spatial sciences, the spatial lens, is a, is a methodological area where we could actually look at social ecological systems and feedbacks. In terms of the model, it's an experimental environment. We can actually vary social and ecological characteristics that would be, I think, impossible to do in a real world field setting. So that gives us a lot of power to explore complex systems. We can also test novel hypotheses about different network topologies. What I have in the model is probably the simplest possible network topology. But there's so many different hypotheses there that we can explore. And also I think that we can start to build more um, predictive tools that forecast impacts both for wildlife and humans that account for the feedbacks. Something that many of us know are there but are kind of hard to incorporate quantitatively and empirically and we can start to, to build those tools. Thanks. That's all I have. If there's time for questions, I would be happy to take them. Yeah. So theoretically, 
this has major application to using the kind of network topology to interventions in, for instance, wildlife trafficking, or instances where you get a very high value symbolic product like rhino horn or whatever. But maybe the, the impact on through social media or through high status opinions might actually be a ma major managerial intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think to the point about more complex network topologies, there's a lot of really interesting work about who the individuals are in the network. And right in this, they were all the same. But you can imagine that you could start to have like influencers, elders, leaders, and start to look at the centrality of that person in their network and test different, you know, how much can they influence, you know, sh changing this particular pattern if it's trade or, or response to conflict, depending on who the messaging goes to. Um, yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of interesting work out there, and some of it's counterintuitive. I can't remember, maybe it was uh, Dr. Wittemeyer, we were talking about some work that's um, implemented interventions, and they hypothesized that the influencer, you know, would be the person that would be most likely to permeate that message to the group. And they found that actually it depends on the influencer, because they themselves can be self-interested. And so they might be actually utilizing their network for their own purposes and not actually helping to convey your message in the most conservation-friendly way. So, I mean, there's so much there that I think needs to be done. Yes, sir. Colorado might have an opportunity in the near future to manage wolves, mm -hmm. wolves that either moved into the state or wolves that will be introduced. What uh, advice might you give about data collection, about landscapes and human dimensions to uh, inform that process? Yeah, um, great, great question. And I've heard just a little bit about the wolf thing in Colorado. Um, I guess what I would say is um, that I certainly think, based on the conversation, that networks are, are not trivial in the the way that the, nar the narrative is taking place, that the thinking about networks, who's conveying the message, and what information they're having and conveying to their particular constituents could actually be highly in, uh, impactful in driving the narrative in certain ways. Um, the other thing I think would be really fascinating, and just maybe this is a pure research side of things, is um, all of this changes. I mean, we would expect that attitudes will change, and I guess I'm curious if wolves come on the landscape, you go out and you measure how people feel now, we have certain expectations of how they should feel afterwards. Are those expectations true? And I don't, I don't know that we've really had a lot of experiments like that to say people should change their behaviors or attitudes this way um, in, real, in real cases. So that's, you know, part of me, the research side of me is kind of like, oh, let's get out there and get some surveys and spatialize them and start understanding that. But the other thing I think too is start thinking about who are the participants in the narrative, what is their role, and start fleshing out those, those networks. I mean, if I were gonna say a takeaway from my own work has been I have underestimated the influence of social networks. And it's only now that I'm starting to, you know, read the literature in different fields and see, oh, this, this actually could be a game changer um, and it's just, Personally, I have to figure out ways to integrate it into the work, but I think it could apply pretty well to that issue in question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned earlier in your presentation the role or potential lack of information regarding um, the impacts of ecotourism. Could you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I mean, part of it was that we were trying to interrogate why there was a positive relationship to distance to bear range because the assumption was just that if you're on the front lines of, of bears coming out of Yellowstone, that you, these would be ranchers that are experiencing a relatively novel level of conflict and would uh, and be negative about it, you know, want to see some, some, some change. And because we saw this, you know, statistical relationship that there was, they were actually more accepting of grizzlies in terms of bear range that we thought, well, let's look at that actual estimate. It's a pretty crude spatial predictor because you basically have two points and then the distance metric, it just kind of goes like, whoosh. you know, there's not a lot of complex configuration of that spatial predictor. And so we started wondering, well, are we, are we just getting confounded by the fact that Yellowstone is kind of a unique case? It's not, 
it's not like a national forest land where it's a multi-use area. It's, it's, there's ecotourism projects and, and work all over there. And so I, we thought there might be a huge role that ecotourism has in influencing, mediating people's acceptance. Maybe the ranchers can participate. I mean, I really don't know the literature, but maybe they're aware of and participating in ecotourism industry there and are viewing grizzlies in light of their, of their benefits rather than purely the costs. Um, so it's really an alternative hypothesis to explain that relationship to bear range. But I think there's, there's definitely something there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this talk, thank you. Um, and I really like what you've done combining the spatial components. But I was wondering how much you've looked into the temporal components. And mm -hmm. so you mentioned wanting to look at land tenure and how long people have been living in these landscapes. Um, my lab mate, my former lab mate works with grizzly bear human conflict on the front range outside of Glacier where they're expanding into uh, ranch lands there mm -hmm. and it seems like these newer areas where people are facing grizzlies for the first time there's often times a lot less tolerance. Yeah, yeah. So before I forget, you, may, you reminded me of something I thought about. Um, you know, with trying to connect the dots with this stuff, and, and, and you made me think about with land tenure, one thing I think moving forward that would be really interesting is fusing different data types. We have the survey, and we can, we can get a lot of really good information in the survey. We didn't even talk about focus groups, qualitative work. And I think that if we, in the future, you know, because it was a little bit, this is the first time that I had done this, so we didn't think about the ways these would all like fit together. But I can imagine that you would ask questions that would give you that additional level of detail in the survey so that when you got these spatial relationships, you were able to say, we've got three alternative hypotheses, but the survey data and our focus groups, they triangulate and tell us that it's this one. So that, I think, that would be really kind of neat to do is you do it all together. So then you could say, don't worry, we did these focus groups. We know that it's the newcomers yeah. that are experiencing this. And that's where that tolerance is. That's the mechanism of that low tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think that's the case, and I, and I wonder if some of it's the kind of landscape they live in. If you live in a landscape where you're actually experiencing conflict, or are you in a, dev a relatively developed area where your actual risk is low? Um, all of these are ranchers, so they probably are experiencing some level of risk, per you know, some of which is perceived, but it could be, it's real. Um, but yeah, the, not, the fear of the new is something that we were considering as one explanation for that distance to bear range, but you're providing kind of an alternative hypothesis, which, which would be your newcomers, amenity-driven migration is a big deal in this area, so people are flooding in who've never lived and experienced with that, and then going, whoa, never mind, I do not want this here. Yeah, that'd be interesting to kind of do a um, compare, contrast, kind of interrogate that some more. Yeah. All right, well, seems like wrapped up. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah.